In the first passage quoted, the earth is flooded by an abundance of waters, which come from below the earth and from above the heavens, which is the origin of both blessing and judgment. Both sets of waters here are given equal emphasis in regard to the volume of water which completely deluged the earth, and this combination of two sets of waters, neither of which is visible to the human eye, gives the lie to sceptical evaluations of the Great Flood, which calculate the generation of such a huge volume of water as impossible. For the waters topped the highest of Earth's mountains by more than twenty feet, something not possible, if the volume of water in the present seas was alone the source of the Great Flood Genesis. 7.20 In the second passage quoted, the phrase heavens of the heavens, often also translated highest heavens, is a reference to the third heaven located above the twin heavens of sky and space. The second half of Psalm 148.4 treats the layer of water between this third heaven and the other two heavens, making it abundantly clear that these waters above cannot be mere atmospheric moisture, but must instead be the second set of waters divided by the Genesis 1, 6 and 7 firmament, far above the atmosphere at the very top of the universe. In the third passage quoted, the heavens of Genesis 1, 6 and 7 have this same separating function. Peter's juxtaposition of the heavens, the earth and the two sets of waters shows clearly that it is the heavens which existed long ago, which are the first means of re-establishing the earth, that is, by dividing the two sets of waters. For the earth has come out of water, that is, it appears above the waters as they fall down into their collecting place, the earthly sea, and through the midst of water, that is, the heavens as a firmament, have split the waters below from those above for earth's benefit, making possible the collection into seas of the waters below. Again, although these waters above and the twin heavens upon which they rest are really two separate things, they are nevertheless both far above the earth, and are therefore occasionally described as being of a piece, precisely as in the description of this layer of water, as firmament, as we have seen in Ezekiel 1.22 through 28 and 10.1. In fact, the Hebrew word for heavens, shamayim, though the precise etymology is disputed, very probably means place of the waters, that is, it is a phrase meaning, there are the waters, equals shamayim, which meaning would represent an allusion both to the atmospheric waters within the first heaven and to the boundary waters above them in the second, though these waters above are technically distinct from the heavens as we have seen. Finally, the conflation of these waters above with the firmament of the heavens is also clearly represented in the construction of the Laver Sea as we have seen. For in this earthly representation of the heavenly sea, it is the water which represents the heavenly sea proper, while the brazen container technically represents the containing, restraining firmament of the heavens. Will you hammer out with him a firmament for the clouds, which is hard as a mirror which has been forged of bronze? Job 37.18 These waters above also serve an important separative purpose. Just as the firmament was reconstructed by God, to separate and restrain the two sets of waters, Genesis 1, 6 and 7, so the waters above serve to separate the third heaven, the holy temple of God, from the corrupted world beneath. This separating function is clearly visible as well in the case of the waters below, which stand in the progression of heaven-earth, waters below, between the earth and the subterranean chambers of Hades beneath it, Job 26, 5 and 6. That is why, for example, Hades is also occasionally referred to as the Abyss, in exactly the same conflation of technically distinct regions as we saw in the use of firmament for waters above the firmament in Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10, because Hades is far beneath these waters below and can only be accessed through them, it can be described in biblical terminology as part of the same conglomerate, in the same way that since both the heavens and the waters above must be penetrated. In order to reach the third heaven, these two technically distinct regions can for many purposes be considered as if they were of a piece, just as the Laver Sea and its waters are considered a unit. This separating function of the waters below also explains why in Revelation 20.13 it is the sea which is said to give up her dead, not because there are any departed spirits in the sea, 
but rather because the sea is the separating layer which locks in, so to speak, the unsaved dead beneath in Hades, Job 26, 5 and 6 and 38, 16 and 17. The waters above likewise perform an analogous separating function, forming an important wall of division between the holy precinct of the third heaven above them and the cosmos of the devil, Satan's corrupt world, which lies below them. Viewed schematically, therefore, the two sets of waters may be represented in the following way. Thus both sets of waters are, in theological terms, separating seas, dividing death and Hades from the corrupt world of the living in the case of the waters below, and the corrupt world of the living from the holy abode of God in the case of the waters above. Without this separating shielding function of the heavens, of which this frozen sea of Revelation 4-6 is the upper crust, the currently corrupt heavens and earth would flee away in the presence of the awesome glory of the Holy Lord God Almighty, Revelation 20.11. It is important to note, however, that despite the present separation of holiness above from corruption below, a separation without which the continued existence of our world would not be possible, God has in no way isolated himself from the world. On the contrary, he has always maintained a powerful and comprehensive witness to this world through the very nature of his creation, through the ministry of human and angelic agents, and finally, and most significantly, through the sending and the sacrificing of his own beloved Son. And the day will come when this barrier of water no longer separates us from God, when God himself has purged with fire the world we know, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12, when instead of a corrupted cosmos, there will be new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3.13 When God himself will dwell among us on that new earth. Revelation 21.3 And when the brilliant glory of his being will no longer be incompatible with the world's continued existence, but will be instead the light whereby we walk. Revelation 21.23 and 24 and 22.5 On that blessed and glorious day, from thenceforth and forever there shall be no more sea. Revelation 21, 1. On that blessed and glorious day, the only thing resembling the waters below shall be waters of life, which flow down from before the Lord. Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And the only thing resembling the frozen waters above shall be the crystal of which the new Jerusalem is built. Revelation 21, 18 through 21. Instead of serving as a temporary liquid barrier between Hades and the world of the living, through which the unsaved dead must inevitably pass, the waters of life will flow freely for everlasting blessing and fellowship with him. And instead of being a frozen barrier separating us from his holiness, as the waters above now do, the brilliantly crystalline walls and streets of the New Jerusalem will provide a permanent, abiding, solid home of unprecedented blessing forevermore.